All right, gang, it's seven o'clock. Time to get going. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Frank Kane, the president of the Central Florida Astronomical Society. That still feels kind of weird. Thank you for joining us tonight on this uh, glorious clear evening. We'll try to make this as quick as possible so you can get out there and enjoy the clear skies. But first, for anyone that's joining us who's not currently a member of CFAS, why would you want to join CFAS? There are many reasons. Let me enumerate them for you. So first of all, you get access to our private events and dark sky viewing locations. For example, the Geneva Dark Sky site that we'll hopefully be getting out to this weekend. More on that in a moment. And also the uh, holiday party that we're having on December 16th. More on that in a moment, too. Our most popular benefit is the Loner Telescope Program, where you get to borrow a telescope for a few weeks and see if you like it before you go out and buy one. So it's a good way to sort of get your feet wet with your new telescope free of charge. We also have an online community through groups.io that can uh, just run through email. So no social media required, but you can learn from other fellow members and whet your astronomy appetite that way. We also offer quarterly meetings at Seminole States Planetarium, which is kind of the coolest place for an astronomy club to meet that I can think of. Your membership also comes with Astronomical League membership, which means their observing programs are available to you, as well as the Reflector magazine every quarter. If you want to join, head on over to cfast.org. And we have memberships that range from $15 to $55 per year. It's cheap, so check it out. Club news before we get started into our main speakers. So December 16th, save the date. 6 to 9 p.m. is the indoor portion of the event for our holiday party at the Geneva campus of Seminole State College. That's out at our dark sky observing site. We will have food. We will have desserts. We'll have good people, good company. We'll have free stuff, the usual door prizes as well. And afterwards, after 9, or if we get out earlier... We'll also have observing at the uh, dark sky site out at the uh, little driving range there where you can set up your telescopes and enjoy the clear dark skies. It will be at the tail end of the uh, Geminid meteor shower as well. So might get a few uh, bonus meteor sightings out there at the same time. So yeah, make sure you uh, save that. We'll have more details going out soon, including an RSVP link. And uh, thanks to Isabel Chauvetan for putting together that way cool graphic and also taking the lead on organizing this event. We have some business to attend to next month as well during that holiday party. Uh, we need to approve the 2024 budget while we're there. That won't take too long. And we have a couple of speakers lined up for you as well for the indoor portion of the event. Uh, our own Sean Quinn here at CFAS is the manager of NASA's Exploration Ground Systems Program at the Kennedy Space Center. How cool is that? He's going to talk to us about the Artemis Program and what's going on locally with that. Also, Phil Rosenberg will be talking about the 100 Telescope Project and also some of his adventures in building his own observatory. And also, did I mention free food, good company, door prices, and hopefully some observing if the weather permits. Other news for the club. Uh, this weekend, we do have a Geneva Dark Sky Dates Reserve. If you want to check on the dates for that at any time, just go to the calendar at groups.io, cfast.groups.io. So uh, stay tuned. We do tend to wait till the day or day or two before to actually schedule that because weather can be iffy here in Central Florida, as you know. So keep your eye on announcements from cfast.groups.io for final arrangements on that. And a special thanks to Mark Pernal, Eric Hoyne, and Bill Castro for making all those dark sky nights happen and organizing them all and getting the keys to open the gates and doing all the stuff that's needed to make it actually occur. Also, we're giving the cfast.org website a revamp. So thank you to Rob Fleming for stepping up and helping out with that effort. We need your images, though. We want this new website to be more media heavy. So if you have media, we'll take it. Send it to me at president at cfast.org if you have any cool astrophotos sitting around that you want to feature on the site. And if you have any photos of past outreach events or educational events from CFAS, we'd love to get our hands on those as well. So if you could get those to me, uh, hoping to package that all up and get it off to Rob by Friday. So send me a go rummaging through your digital archives and see what you got. Appreciate it. Coming up for outreach events, uh, for anyone that's new to the club, a big part of what we do is getting out there with telescopes and sharing them with the public and getting more people excited about what's up in the night sky. Next event is November 13th at Bridgewater Middle School in Winter Garden. They're having a night sky event and uh, a lot went on behind the scenes to work out the insurance for that to make it actually happen. But I think we got it all worked out. So that's actually happening now. We also have an event at the Pinecrest Lake Academy. They're having a steam night out in Claremont. If you want to support that, that's on November 15th. Also, Fabco, the French American Business Council of Orlando, Isabel's uh, putting that one together in Windermere. We do have all the volunteers we need for that one, but Isabel sent out some details earlier. If you want to check that out, it's a good opportunity to enjoy some good French food and French wine and hang out with some CFAS members as well. So um, a little bit of an authentic French experience there, uh, and it's a lot cheaper than Epcot and better too. So check that out too. Coming up on December 9th, the Powder Horn event, Powder Horn event at Lake Wales. I think that's a Boy Scout thing, right? And also, we have Astronomy on Tap happening on December 12th. And I think, uh, Sharifa, you're going to be speaking at that, aren't you? Uh, I'm not sure if it's this month or next month, but I'll talk about that in a moment. 
And if you want to get involved in any of that, outreach at cfast.org is your contact or just respond on groups.io to any threads about these to make it happen. And thank you to Douglas Woods for making the outreach program as a whole happen. Quick recognition of people who did some outreach last month. We had some events at the Orlando Science Center at Winter Springs Elementary, and we also had some online outreach events as well. Like uh, me and Derek did a little online uh, web thing for the solar eclipse. And I know Jason Higley has been doing some stuff too as well. He's going viral. He's got a little uh, clip of uh, a reaction to a meteor shower with, with his online stream on Twitch and had like 20,000 views last time I checked. So that's quite the outreach. And a quick thank you to everyone else that I know of who participated in our organized events last month. So thank you everyone on the slide. And for everyone that's not on that slide, thank you too as well. I know a lot of you just set up a telescope out on the sidewalk for Halloween and showed a few trick-or-treaters, some nice little treats in the sky. So appreciate everyone who did that as well. Upcoming astronomical events. So uh, lots going on. Don't miss Jupiter this month. It's, it's just past its opposition. What that means is that if you were to draw a line from the sun to the earth and extend that outward, Jupiter would be on the other end of that line, which means it's about as close as it gets to us. And it's also directly illuminated about as much as it gets. So best time to be observing Jupiter right now. Um, I was out there trying to capture it last night. I don't know what I did wrong, but uh, I could not get an image as good as this one last night. But try again. Try, try again. Saturn's not bad either. It is a little bit past opposition, but the advantage is that it's up er earlier in the night sky. So as soon as it gets dark, Saturn's up there waiting for you at a pretty good elevation. So that's always a crowd pleaser. And tonight at 4 a.m., the moon and the planet Venus will be within one degree of each other. So that should be a neat thing to see. If you get up in the pre-dawn hours, take a look at the moon. It'll have a little uh, buddy with it. That's Venus. The Northern Taurid meteor shower is peaking on November 11th, and uh, I try not to get people too hyped up about meteor showers because, you know, uh, if you're not in a dark site and you're expecting like this rain of shower, uh, this literal shower of meteors, that's not how they work. But um, they're still cool to see if you're outside anyway, and you might see an occasional streak across the sky, which is always fun to see. Uranus has its opposition on November 13th, and it coincides with a new moon as well. So that's a great time to be looking at Uranus, either observing or imaging it. And then we have the Leonid meteor showers as well, November 17th to 18th. And a little reminder, most meteor showers are best viewed in the pre-dawn hours. That's when you're facing into the orbit of the Earth and you get the highest velocity and direct hits from those meteors. Also, there's no moon during that time, which is the good news. The bad news is it's not expected to be an overly active Leonid meteor shower this year. But hey, if you're outside anyway, take a look up. You might get a little bit of a, a good surprise. Tonight's agenda. We have, uh, we're going to start off with Sharifa Gassel with her Tales from the High Seas. See what I did there? Uh, and we'll learn more about that momentarily. Uh, she had some incredible adventures out in Hawaii doing an analog astronaut experience. And I am extremely excited to hear about what happened there. And following that, we have Luke Corwin doing our main presentation, Ghost Particles from the Sky, which I think is the coolest title ever for a talk about neutrinos. Got a little bit of an introduction to neutrino astronomy from Luke. So thank you, Sharifa and Luke, for presenting tonight. And we'll wrap up with our astrophotography showcase, as always. So with that, let me stop sharing, and I will hand it over to Sharifa. Thank you, Frank. And thanks for uh, having me back again so I can talk a little bit about my latest adventure. Uh, like you said, I will Absolutely. probably, as I'm getting my shared screen going, uh, I will probably be presenting, still working out the details, but for December 12th on the Astronomy on Tap um, in Oviedo. And so the Orlando Brewing Company, I believe. So still working out the little last minute details and stuff, but it looks like we're good to go for that. So let me go ahead and bring this up. All right. So like Frank said, my name is Shetty Figasel, and I am a licensed mental health counselor, a licensed professional counselor, qualified supervisor. I'm also a NASA JPL solar system ambassador and more recently an analog astronaut. So I am here today to give you kind of an overview, a brief overlook of what an analog astronaut is, a little bit about the mission, um, not really getting too, too much into the detail about the research that was done. Very cool stuff. Um, hoping to coordinate and organize uh, more programs about it so that we can kind of delve into it a little bit deeper. But um, if you're welcome to check out my website, www.thespacetherapist.com. And I'm going to be probably posting like updates and stuff as they come with the research and we process it and, and whatever. So all that'll be on there, some cool pictures. Welcome to take a look. So we'll start out with this awesome picture. <clears throat> Excuse me. This was during a night EVA. So this was an extravehicular activity that we did in one of the missions and we went outside of the habitat, which I will explain more in detail in just a minute. So as you can see, you might recognize some features in the Milky Way. I uh, can see the Pleiades right there. 
and it was completely pitch black. So this is all just kind of on my belly looking through um, my camera, getting some some long exposures with it. So about me, like I said, licensed mental health counselor, I have a private practice, do telehealth. That's important because a lot of what this research was, it ties in my work as a therapist with space. All right. So this is kind of the intersection of where those two things will combine. And uh, you'll see why in a minute. So the kind of tagline for the purpose for this and for my practice, my private practice and for my work as an analog astronaut is exploring space and inspiring Earth. A lot of it ties in also with astronomy and kind of what do we have to learn about space that we can bring back to Earth and then grow from there. So one of my favorite pictures uh, with Mauna Kea in the background and uh, the habitat of the foreground, like in the middle there. And uh, yeah, we're in a little space suit. So what is an analog astronaut? So I tell people an analog astronaut and they get confused sometimes. By the way, the puns, they're, they're everywhere. So, you know, you're welcome, like dad jokes and stuff. So what an analog astronaut is not, it's not an audio signal. I'm not a clock with hands. People are very confused sometimes with like, is it what's an analog astronaut as opposed to a digital astronaut or something. We don't go to space as analog astronauts. Some analog astronauts have become astronauts that have flown into space, but an analog astronaut itself does not experience microgravity. Um, and so, like I said, we're not clocks. So uh, analog meaning analogous, and we're basically humans that simulate long duration space missions. Uh, come from a variety of different backgrounds and you come in, you apply for a mission. And if you get selected, then you go and you do the analog mission at, a, at an analog facility. So this particular one, was in Hawaii. And um, when we get there, we do the, the, with the crew, we do different research experiments and we each have different kinds of research that we bring along with us. So the whole point of this is to mimic different missions that would be geographically similar to the moon and Mars. And so it's kind of like a testing ground to test out technology, testing out different kinds of research, identifying problems that astronauts that do go to the moon, Mars or beyond, or even in the International Space Station, we're kind of their test dummies to test out some of the technology, some of the research, even before it gets to that point, to figure out what what goes well, what goes wrong, and then take it from there. And so a lot of it can be problem solving. Uh, because of that, there's a lot of collaboration with different space programs. Um, some of the research can go to the different space programs, can go to private sector, anything is fair game. We're basically just testing out um, you know, research studies. So this particular habitat is called High Seas, stands for Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation. I know that's a mouthful. And the research was done uh, in the Big Island of Hawaii. So if you look, if you're familiar with the Big Island of Hawaii, Mount Akea is at the kind of, at the, if you look at the map, it's kind of at the, the northern part of the island. And I can see if I can use my mouse. And then Mount Aloha, which is the, where we were located, is uh, kind of in the center of the island. And so the habitat is located on the slopes of Mount Aloha. So Mount Aloha is the tallest, um, it's taller than Everest. So it's actually from the seafloor up to the very top. It's it's taller than Everest and it reaches about 30,000 feet in elevation if you were to measure from below the ocean. From sea level up to the top, to the summit, it's about 13,679 feet. So the habitat for high seas, six sits at about 8,200 feet in elevation, which is where we lived. So the length of the mission that I was on was two weeks long. Some missions have been a week long. Some missions for people have been about eight months in length, like eight to nine months were some of the first ones. And so the location of this, um, if you guys have ever been to Mount Aloha or the Big Island, you know that it's a lot of volcanoes and everything is basically volcanic in that area. Um, it's also one of the most physically demanding analogs because we're in the middle of nowhere in a volcano, at least an hour away from anyone coming to you know, help us in case of an emergency or anything like that. And so the habitat is self-sustaining. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what that is. So we're on lava and uh, I'll show you more pictures, cool pictures of what this all looks like. But when we're on lava, there's different kinds of lava. So they give you kind of a, an overview when you get there of you know, orientation of what you can and can't do, walk on, whatever. So it's nothing out there, nothing really growing. It's just us, the habitat. You know, it was a crew of six of us and just kind of a, you know, empty plane of, of lava. There's two different kinds of lava that they kind of teach you a little bit about. There is the Pahoy Hoi, and I might be butchering that. It's in uh, Hawaiian, and Aa volcano. So those are uh, lava. So it's two different types. 
And when you're hiking around, it becomes important because you don't want to step on the ah, but you do want to step on the pahoy hoy. So it's all basalt and it's about 52% weight in silica, which is similar to a lot of the regolith on the moon. Some differences, but basically the same kind of thing. And so that's why they use this habitat as a, as a great analog for lunar and Martian missions. One of the important things when you're going around and you kind of see the terrain, in the picture you can see the top is a uh -uh lava. And so I like to remember it like, uh-uh, you don't want to walk on that one, like, uh-uh. So, you know, you don't walk on the uh-uh. Uh. And <laughs> the reason why it's called uh-uh uh, uh, in Hawaiian, but it, it cools quickly and it moves fast. And because of that, so when the lava is coming from the volcano, it cools quickly. And so it becomes brittle and it becomes sharp. And if you're not careful when you're walking on it, you have to have really heavy hiking boots. We went out with knee pads, leather gloves, you know, covered in the spacesuit analog uh, from head to toe. You, you, this, this stuff can, can cut. Yeah. So it's not, you don't want to go on it um, if you can help it. So the pahoy hoy is a different kind. So it's a little bit smoother, it cools slower. So it becomes easier to walk on, a little bit more solidified. Um, and this one you can, you can walk on. So where that comes into play. So I have some cool pictures. Hopefully I can show some of these in the planetarium and the dome um, because they're really, really neat to be able to kind of look at all these little details and stuff. But in the top picture, the, the panoramic that I took, I'm standing right in the middle and you can see where this becomes a challenge maybe with walking and navigating the different kinds of lava. Kind of see um, the redder parts. Those are the, uh, -uh. some of those are the uh, -uh ones and then the, the, darker, richer, smoother ones are the Bohoi Hoi type. And so you can kind of figure out when you're kind of out on an EVA exploring the area. It can be hard to kind of navigate some of that. Top right of the panoramic, you see the habitat that we lived in. And um, it is obviously off the grid. There's not really much out there except for solar panels. There's a gray, um, gray tank for, for water. And there is a Starlink little uh, receiver out there also. And uh, you might see a little porthole in the dome in there. That'll be important in a minute. So on the bottom, uh, in the left side, you see the ah, -ah on there. And, and they're kind of, I have, I have some examples. It's hard to see on here, but I have them. You know, I can bring them to the planetarium during an in-person meeting or something. But some of the, the lava that, uh, with permission and everything, to, to bring. And then it has, you could see some of the, the, the roughness of it. You can feel it. And if you've ever felt pumice or lava or anything like that, you could see the difference of it. And crumbles kind of hard to get good footing in, really light, obviously. So it's not the, the easiest thing to hike on. The one on the right would be the Pohoi Hoi towards the bottom. And so you're navigating through these, imagining that you're on the moon and the surface of the moon. It's very cool stuff uh, with your crew. And then in the middle picture behind me, I have a giant volcano tube. Right? It's just a volcano tube down to the depths of Mordor and the center of the earth. Um, so a lot of these volcano tubes were also where we would do uh, EVA. So the more extravehicular activities to explore. Uh, some of the, the crew had experiments that they tested in the volcano tubes. Um, and so, yeah, we would just kind of hike around either for fun or for research. And um, yeah. So why on earth would we pick this spot? I mean, maybe not me, but because I didn't really have anything to do with the spot, but why, why would they pick high seas and why would they pick a volcano, the Mauna Loa volcano to do this? Because of what I said with, with the, the terrain. And so it mimics the lunar surface pretty close with, with what we know. And this is a picture inside one of the volcano tubes that was in one of the missions. This is not me. This is one of my crewmates. Um, and he was actually working on some hardware for the Artemis missions. And um, yeah, just some really neat stuff and being able to do different kinds of lighting um, with it. There was a couple experiments for Artemis that were actually tested in the neutral buoyancy lab that he was able to bring to the habitat and test out in the surface and then all is in the volcano tubes uh, for this. So, um, I mean, the, not a lot of people know that the moon has volcano tubes too. And uh, it also has magma at the core. And it, it's different than the type on Earth. And by no means am I a volcanologist, but there can be a lot of overlap with why, you know, why, why on the moon and why on Earth. So, dome, sweet dome, this is where we lived. So the whole habitat is 1,200 square feet. So not all of it is livable because it is a dome, but it, it, it's, a, it's a comfortable one compared to some analog missions. And um, like I said, it's on the side of the Mauna Loa volcano. You drive out there, it's about an hour drive. 
very off the road, you know, off the grid type thing. And then so you get there, you see a little hab van, the hab for short for habitat, little habitat van down there. And uh, we went in at the beginning of the two weeks. And then from that point, we didn't go outside. Unless we were in the EVA, we were in the spacesuits. So this has been home to five successful long duration missions and a bunch more of the shorter term. So the longer duration space flights or analogs were four to 12 months and they were NASA uh, is the ones who originally started this habitat and they were Mars simulation missions. And they lasted, like I said, four to 12 months, give or take for a while. And then now more recently, um, the habitat is actually owned by Hank Rogers, who is the founder of the creator of Tetris. Um, fun fact. And so he owns the, the dome and everything um, belonging to that. Missions now were one to two weeks, depending on the mission that you're selected for. Um, and like I said, it's a lot of partnerships, a lot of collaborations with uh, different companies, private and, and government. Um, and I will actually say the mountain in the background, you'll see in a minute. And in, in the background, in these pictures is Mount Achaia, which uh, you might be familiar with the observatories. So every day I got a fantastic view of the Mount Achaia <laughs> observatories from the one porthole that was inside the dome. Uh, we we're a crew of six and our mission was EMMIHS 23 stands for Euro Moon Mars International Moon Base Alliance, High Seas 2023. You know, space loves their, uh, their acronyms. So there you go. There's another one. Our mission nickname was Lokahi, which in Hawaiian means unity. And uh, you can see that reflected in our mission patch. Um, and we have the crew. Four of us were American. Two of, of the crew were Belgian or are Belgian. And uh, you see from left to right, we have uh, the chief scientist, the communications officer, picture on the left on from left to right, uh, myself, and then the commander, I was the medical officer, the commander, the um, chief engineer, and then the vice commander. And so on the right, the floor is lava. You're welcome. Crew experiments, not gonna get too much into this uh, today, but there's a ton of stuff, ton of experiments this is the reason why we're there. Each of us brought about one to two experiments, personal experiments. There are also experiments in the habitat that we did on behalf of high seas, on behalf of previous researchers. Part of our schedule was scheduled for us every day and uh, we would go ahead and do that. So my personal experiment, one of them, the primary one was to measure the impact of crew isolation and lunar simulation on human behavior. So what I did was basically test basic needs of the crew every single day. I'd set up a med check, so a medical check, psychological check, and go through what their basic needs were, how they were feeling about it, and have conversations with them if uh, if they wanted to. So yeah, we have a different spacesuit art project, which was inspired by uh, Nicole Stott Space for Art Foundation, putting together a spacesuit from an analog mission, uh, which could be similar art installation to what she does with her space flown um, spacesuits with um, you know kids that create dart swatches and, and they create spacesuits. The third one is another experiment with isolating microbes and bacteria and then the right is some of the Artemis hardware that I had previously mentioned. So food. I'm gonna go through the quick the basic needs that I mentioned that I measured. Um, so the food this was fun. We, <laughs> we had dehydrated vegetarian food and that was what our meals consisted of. If you've ever seen food that is like for, I don't know, if you're like a prepper or something or for hurricanes or whatever, they have these big tubs with like a 10 to 15 year shelf life of powdered food. That's what we ate. And so you see some of the tubs on the bottom right. There is tomato powder and powdered cheese and a bunch of stuff. So there was no fresh produce for obvious reasons. They don't have fresh produce in space unless... There's a cargo resupply, and then they might get a helping of that, which would be a nice treat. You'd see that after two weeks. Um, we also had to experiment with different ways of cooking. Right? You don't think, oh, well, I'm going to go cook dinner. I'm going to go cook whatever. And all of your ingredients are powdered. Yeah, you have a lot of creativity. We'd alternate with different crews cooking every single day. We took different shifts for doing that. And so we got pretty creative. Most of the time, it was brown meals and a lot of soup and what we called hab bread. Um, we had some surprises. So there was like a ton of Bisquick pancake mix. So we made pancakes for, for Sunday breakfast one time. There's also limited water. Whatever water had been brought into the habitat, that was it. That was all we had. So part of the chief engineer uh, duties was to monitor that we didn't, one, short out the electricity and that the solar panels that were there were fully charged every day so that we didn't lose power because that would be a problem. 
since we're middle of nowhere and that we were doing okay with water. So then that, that'll be important in a minute. So um, in the middle picture on the bottom, you see kind of kind of hard to see, but you can see the, the table. All of our meals were done together, three meals a day. We all ate together. We all kind of cooked and took turns and we had one snack most days that was given to us um, and we would only be allowed to eat it all at the same time. So it wasn't kind of like you can graze all day. Um, I lost about 10 pounds after this mission. So <laughs> one of the, the really cool, helpful things was uh, I used the cookbook Meals for Mars that was written by Dr. Cyan Proctor, uh, one of the astronauts on Inspiration4. And so she was the one of the first crews in high seas to set up everything at the high seas habitat for um, like one of their first missions. And so a lot of their meals actually had meat in them and uh, it had to modify some of the meals and everything with it, but her, her book was definitely a huge help. So after we eat, all right, maybe not immediately after, but every day we would have one and a half to two, like one to two hours of exercise every single day. Very important when you're living in this habitat, can't go outside unless you're in a spacesuit. And we only did that about four times in the whole two weeks. We'd have one porthole, which you can kind of see me poking out of in there. Um, and so we did exercise and we had a stationary bike that was very cool because I could position it right. Looking out of the porthole, great views of Mount Achaia and the observatories. I would just like, you know, imagine that I was cycling through the fields of lava to, I don't know. And it was just neat to be able to look out there and um, look out over the clouds if they were coming in or whatever. We had a treadmill, some free weights, nothing too fancy. Um, one of the, the crew, the vice commander, he was actually uh, an amateur boxer. So he did individual training with us and we got creative. Um, and then obviously after the one to two hours, if we did sign up for an EVA, which had to be pre-approved by mission control, we would go outside and they go for an hour or two hike, uh, basically. So a lot of workout, a lot of, you know, with soup. Um, so it was hard, you know, it's very, very hard to do that. We have hygiene. I said there was limited water and I meant that. So we didn't get any showers. We had one, I take that back. We had one shower in the whole week, two week uh, missions, one weekend. So on the Sunday, right in the middle, we had one three minute shower, uh, each of us. And that was in the, the little shower thing, the little tube on the right. And we had little showers in there. There's no indoor plumbing. So there were compost toilets. And part of, of being an analogous mission is that we test out some of the, the technologies for how do you fix things in space when you don't have Home Depot that you can just drive to and buy something. Compost toilet downstairs was broken. So part of it was figuring out, what do we do? You know, problem solving as a crew, figuring out creative ways of pulling from our strengths, uh, coming together and figuring it out. And it was stinky. So, you know, we made it work. <laughs> a lot of baby wipes. And we also didn't have laundry that we can access. We had one load of laundry that we could all do together as a collective. So like one load of laundry for the whole crew for the full two weeks. So it was, it was tough, you know, but we all kind of stepped up, took care of ourselves and, and it was good. So another one of the measures that, uh, that I measured was social. And because you're mimicking space mission, we don't have access to social media as we would on earth. And so they do on the International Space Station, but we didn't in this simulation. Uh, we wanted to mimic really being isolated, being separate from it. And so there was no social media. Any contact or anything that we had was either through email, back and forth, but not like a ton. Um, the internet was all blacklisted unless we got certain websites pre-approved to be whitelisted ahead of time. Um, so a lot of our, our research and everything had to be from either what we brought to the table with us or kind of pulling from the strengths from the other crew to get the research done. We did have one 15 minute phone call throughout the whole uh, week mission. So we can either make a phone call, FaceTime, whatever with family back home. And, uh, and yeah, so that was it. So we were pretty isolated in, uh, in, in the hab. Uh, I lucked out big time to be in with a group of fantastically motivated people. I don't know how that worked, but they're awesome. And so we had a, a very motivated group of people. As you see, we're doing space ballet on the bottom. Um, and yeah, so another measure was job satisfaction. I measured this <clears throat> from figuring out kind of like what, how they were feeling about their personal experiments and also figuring out how they felt about the research that was currently in the hub um, and just their roles as a whole. So for example, how would I rate my job as a medical officer? 
how would I rate my job with the research that I brought with me? Um, and so this was important to figure out, you know, so one of these, one of the crew, he was a microbiologist. My background is in microbiology. So at some points he would consult with me for any microbiology type questions that he might need for his, his research um, and, and vice versa. So. So sleeping, sleeping was fun. I, I'm lucky because I'm five four, and the the, the widest parts of the bedrooms were five five. So I slept great. Um, but so anyone that's taller than that would would you know sleep at an angle or something. We did each have our own rooms, which was nice. Uh, different than some other analogs that everybody kind of gets bunk beds or whatever. The sleeping quarters are on the second floor, and it's just it's the only thing up there with one with the second bathroom. Um, and then on the right, you can see how, what the bed and setup and everything look like down there. We had a sleeping bag, we had a little fan, um, and then everything that we brought with us had to fit into that duffel bag. So the, the sides of it, because it's a dome, the tops of the beds were angled. So it was like sleeping in a triangle and in a twin bed is a little tight, but you know, I slept well, <laughs> truly. It was, it was nice. You know, other people were taller, less, less so, but no windows except for that one. So we did have fun, right? We had fun. We're there. I mean, you're going to be in pretend space. Like you're going to have fun. We had movie time. You know, we had some movies that some people had downloaded on their computers that we just kind of hook it in with an HDMI. Uh, we played, you know, some little video games in there. Um, obviously, the EVAs that were fun to, to explore. I mean, come on, you're in you know, Hawaii exploring a volcano. That's pretty cool. And um you know, obviously the, the lava tubes and stuff. And so that's the opening on the right-hand side to a really big lava tube that you would go in. I think it's called the cathedral. I believe that's the one that this cathedral. And then also having fun kind of brainstorming, fixing a drone or fixing um, like an incubator. Just diff one of my, my hoses was, was broken. So it's like I fixed it and um, in my, in my spacesuit. So this is the engineering bay. Um, and in longer presentations, I'll go into a little bit more, but this is basically where we would suit up for going on the EVAs. And um, as I said, we wouldn't be allowed to go outside of the habitat unless you went through a three minute uh, depressurization, depressurization before and repressurization after three minutes each on the front end back end, then you can open the door to the habitat, walk outside. And so we had to be suited in our spacesuits, helmets. Uh, there were air conditioned hoses, a little air conditioner backpack with a first aid kit, just in case anything did actually happen. Um, we had our suits, we had our gloves, we had our knee pads, we had heavy duty hiking boots, everything, and then we can go outside. So future studies from my end is figuring out like ongoing basic needs assessments. I was lucky enough to be able to leave some of my research in the Google Drive for them that currently some of the analogs that are on the mission are actually carrying out right now for, for future missions, which is awesome because I can pull from that and then add to my research. Um, and then also increasing sample size. So uh, I will probably go back at some point next year, uh, hopefully in June is what I'm looking at. So some fun pictures from that. Like I said, these look awesome on the dome. This is a night EVA picture that I took. It's completely pitch black. You can't see anything. Then when you put take the picture, everything lights up. And then you can't tell what's what. Uh, you see the solar panels with the habitat glowing in the background. Milky Way was, I mean, um, it's like indescribable. Uh, again, the dome with the Milky Way in the background. This was a neat one. We were, me and two others were, were going out on a night EVA. We open the door, depressurize everything, step outside. And it was like, okay, it is completely pitch black and I have zero visibility <laughs> anywhere. Would it, what happened? And what happened was that there was a cloud that was right at eye level with us. So we basically opened the door into a cloud and it was like, okay, what do we do? So then I looked up and I noticed that I could see this guy. And so I was like, okay, so this thing is gonna pass in a few minutes, let's just wait, hang out here for a minute. Uh, some of our comms weren't working or whatever. So it was like, okay, you improvise. And then I snapped this picture and uh, this is one of the, the the vice commander. And I was like, oh my God, this is like weird and ethereal. It's, it's not edited in any way. I mean, and some of the colors are you know cleaned up, but it's not, this is the picture. And it was very cool to see um, some other nightscape pictures. This one was taken by uh, the chief engineer. And so that's me on the bottom on the right hand side pointing to the Milky Way. You can see kind of the terrain at night. It's just, it's, it's wild. 
Um, I took this picture, Milky Way in the background. Again, none of this is Photoshop, absolutely none. I promise you can see the raw files. <laughs> they look like an alien. Uh, this one, Chief Engineer took Milky Way, same thing, just you know, lighting this up. Milky Way again, um, with you can see some of the slow slope of the of the volcano. So that is kind of a very quick overview of everything. And I'm gonna stop sharing. So yeah. Wow. All right. If anyone has any questions for Sharifa, <laughs> uh, hit the Q and A button there, and we'll uh, get to wherever we can. Yeah, but uh, I have questions. So, okay. how the heck did you find yourself there? Like, how does one go about becoming an analog astronaut? That's a fantastic question. So, I think I first heard about it from uh, Sly, from Dr. Proctor, and she did a presentation about that book, and I had no idea what an analog astronaut was, and I was like, okay, this is weird, and I kept hearing it come up in different things. There's a couple of them that I kept hearing. High Seas was one of them. Lunaris was another one in Poland. Um, and then obviously have Aquarius, which is what NASA uses for a lot of theirs, the Aquanauts. And I'm like, okay, this is a thing. How do I even do this? And and so I applied. I looked in to see what it was. Uh, NASA has some as well. And I applied, not thinking, well, oh, whatever, okay. And, and they got selected. And so I had kind of at a point in my career and everything in my focus that I had a research project that I wanted to pursue. And so when you have an idea of what it is that you want to study, it makes it easier to, to figure out what you want to apply for. So if there is anyone out there that does have anything that they want to kind of test out, that maybe it's an idea or something that they want to test out for space on earth, apply, you know, apply and give it a shot. Yeah. You never know what will happen until you ask. That's, uh, that's absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. That place looks like it's bigger on the inside. I mean, that dome looks so tiny from the outside I know. pictures. But, uh, a little more I spacious know. than you think. That's cool. I'm joking that it was the TARDIS, but yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, my other question is, how did you feel when this was all over? I mean, you're talking about going back, so I guess it was all right. But like on the spectrum of, oh my gosh, I'm glad, I'm so glad to get yeah. back to Earth to, I want to stay here forever. Where were you at the end of that period? Yeah, I mean, uh, initially it was more of like sensory so if anyone's a scuba diver, it's like, you know, you go for like a two hour, an hour dive and you come back and like you're sensory deprived. A lot of it was that coming out and it's like the sun was just like, like, I hadn't seen the sun in two weeks unless it was through a helmet. So sensory wise, it was an adjustment. Tasting food again, even though it was only two weeks, you know, men menu fatigue, very real thing. Yeah, you, know, you, you stop wanting to eat. And so when you can, it's like, oh, wow. I never want to see soup again. Um, <laughs> but at the end of it, it, it definitely puts things into perspective, you know, and a lot of, you know, I initially went into studying the overview effect. So figuring out perspective and a cognitive shift that the crew might get for the mission and after the mission, the overview effect that I noticed was within the astronauts themselves, within the analogs ourselves, where what was seen after was, wow, I didn't think I could do it. And I did it, you know, and really kind of challenging ourselves and proving that we're capable of doing and withstanding so much more discomfort than we ever give ourselves credit for. And so that's been an ongoing thing for me. It's like, eh, is it really that big of a deal? You know, really pushing that. Yeah. It's a real so. testament to our adaptability in, uh, in tough situations. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wes has a question. Wesley Clem, uh, he wants to know, were there any fail conditions like using too much water or power in a day? Like, were there any like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the power, I don't know the exact numbers, but the water that was there was it, you know? And so we would every day monitor how much at, we have, we'd have a, uh, a morning briefing and then a debriefing with mission control. Mission control was uh, they come on the screen, do it virtually. And then they would tell us where we were at, you know, what our systems were at, our levels were at. If we needed to cut back on the water usage, water was a problem. You know, it was a thing that's like, you have to cut back on water. You can't use that much. And it was like for dishes because we weren't showering. We weren't really doing anything and just checking in every day what our values were and then adjusting. Same thing with power. We were lucky enough to have sunny days, but because it is solar power, if there were a lot of overcast days, you'd have to monitor. And so we would check by about noon where our power level was and we would have to be at about 85% uh, usage, like still left remaining for the rest of the 24 hours. And then again, by dinner time, when the sun set, that was all the power that we had to get us through the night. 
yeah, so we would just check in every day. Couldn't plug in more than one appliance into the kitchen or else it would short out the system, which it did. And, and you yeah, know, we fixed it and whatever. But yeah. Similar question from Isabel Chauvetan. Uh, what if you had a mental emergency or physical emergency? Would you be pulled out? And what was the threshold for that? That's a fantastic question. So I, w- I was the on-site therapist as well. There was another therapist uh, that was uh, that was off-site that in case of any emergencies or anything, you could contact, call, email, whatever, and she was standby, ready to go. And so we did have a couple different things where some crewmate checked in with me uh, just to make sure, and I checked in with them, obviously, to make sure that they were okay and just kind of do like I would in my private practice and and just doing kind of like a wellness assessment, checking in, making sure they're good, you know, just kind of establishing, triaging what's going on. Same thing with physical. Um, If there was anything physically, I would check the vitals of the crew every day, ask them how they were doing, how they were feeling, how they slept, anything physical going on. If there was anything that was a little bit more concerning, then we would have a doctor on call call the doctor if we needed to. Luckily, that didn't happen. Um, and everybody was very healthy with that. No injuries, no, you know, nothing happened. So yeah, all important stuff. Mm-hmm. All right, let's do one more from uh, Brock Rosser. What was the most memorable thing from this experience? And what did you learn the most and or something that you didn't expect? Um, what I, um, I'll say what I didn't expect. Uh, that's so much. I, I didn't expect that I would that, I mean, me personally, and I think a lot of the crew that we did a debrief after that we would be good with being in the habitat for two weeks. And a lot of it mimicked and mentioned this, Frank, with like, it it was similar to being in the pandemic, right? It's not, we're not great with it, but we did okay. You know, we were good. We figured out ways of, you know, entertaining time, passing time, being productive and staying focused, doing everything. And it worked. Um, The Milky Way and the nighttime EVAs were I mean, no words. Yeah, absolutely no words. That was just, if I could go back just for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds Very amazing. Cool. Look yeah. forward to seeing some of these in the dome in our next meeting. Yeah, me too. At the planetarium and uh, yeah. hopefully some stories from your uh, little excursion to the observatories on Mauna Kea. That must yeah, be pretty awesome yeah. too. Have some cool pictures. Oh, yeah. Cool. I'm sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Sharifa. Yeah, thanks for absolutely. sharing all that with us. And uh, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> cool. And with that, we'll hand it over to Luke Corwin, our awesome. next guest. <laughs> So you're going to talk to us about neutrinos and neutrino astronomy. And you have the coolest background I've seen in a while. You're on mute. Well, thank you. Uh, there you go. I'm just getting my screen sharing set up here. I know. It's like the hardest thing. The you know, PowerPoint gives you like these three windows that all look exactly the same and you never know which one it is. So. <laughs> All right, so there we go. Presenter view. All right, so there we go. Cool. Yes. So now, what's great is I can see my presentation, but I can't see you. So I know you, you can't see your own camera, but uh, you look good. You're still centered, so don't okay. worry. Okay. <laughs> so can you see the little red dot here? Uh, what we see is a cross. It's not red, but we can see something moving. Okay. Anyway, okay. So, as uh, as you said, uh, my name is Luke Corwin, and I'm here to talk about neutrino astronomy, ghost particles in the sky, and I'll get to why we call them that as we go through the talk. So, since I'm introducing something that might be new to a lot of people here, I'm going to take sort of a journalistic approach, the classic who, what, when, where, why, and how. Though I'll be going in a slightly different order that I think works better for this. So I'll be talking about who, why, what when, how, and where, as you can see here. So answering different questions. And of course, I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. So I'll start with the who. And first question is, who am I? Well, my name, like I said, is Luke Corwin. I used to be a particle physicist specializing in experimental neutrino physics. So I really got to know these particles very well. I got my PhD from the Ohio State University in 2008. I was a physics professor in South Dakota for seven years from 2013 to 2020. And then for a year at Stetson University here in Florida before switching careers. And there's a whole long story there uh, that I'm not gonna tell today. 
uh, been a data engineer since 2021 here in Florida. And But I still love physics and astronomy. It's why I'm part of this group and why I'm very grateful for the opportunity to give this talk. Now, when I ask the question who and uh, talk about neutrinos, if you're of a certain age and were of a certain Saturday morning cartoon consumption back in the late 80s, early 90s, you might remember these characters who were called neutrinos from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles animated series. But uh, they're not the ones we're going to be talking about today. But just in case you were thinking of them, I just want you to know I was too. So the next question is why? Specifically, why are neutrinos in an astronomy talk? And the answer is that because they're part of something called multi-messenger astronomy. Now, humans have been looking up at the sky for as long as there have been humans, but we've really only had, for most of human history, one messenger, one thing that could carry information from beyond our atmosphere, and that was light. As we developed, other, developed technologies, we were able to expand to see other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, light, gamma rays, radio waves. We've even had some uh, talk about amateur radio astronomy in this group. But there are other messengers that we have found more recently, including cosmic rays. These are physical particles, usually protons or heavier nuclei that come to us uh, and collide with the atmosphere from other places that we can study when they get here. Uh, gravitational waves is another new one that's been in the news in the past few years. That was a big deal because it opened up a whole new way to see the universe. And neutrinos do as well. They're pro they are physical subatomic particles. They're produced in many celestial objects and events, and I'll go, and go over what some of those are. The important thing about them that's different from cosmic rays is that because they're not charged, and I'll explain what that means, but they travel in a straight line, which means if we see, see a neutrino coming from somewhere, we know it came from wherever, whatever direction we see it in, that we, it traveled straight from wherever it was produced to us. And they give us a window into processes and places we can't see any other way. So they're one of the messengers of astronomy and one of the new ones that we're becoming more and more familiar with. So that's why we want to talk about them. But what are they? You might remember uh, from Dr. Katie Mack's presentation a few months ago, she was talking about dark matter, but she started with a very brief overview of particle physics. And you can see the neutrinos are in this chart right here. There are actually three of them. These are called the three flavors of neutrino. And they are one of about a dozen fundamental constituents of matter that you can't break them down into anything simpler. And they are part of the building blocks of all material reality that we know about. So to go into that in a little bit more detail, Atoms, uh, like you can see over here, are made up of a nucleus and an electron cloud. The nucleus, oh shoot, sorry, I did not mean to do that. Thank you for your patience. Anyway, the nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons, and it's surrounded by an electron cloud. Now, protons and neutrons are not fundamental particles. They are made up of quarks, which are fundamental particles, at least as far as we know, and the electrons are as well. So quarks are their own group of particles. There are up and down quarks. They make up protons and neutrons. And then there are two other generations that are heavier and less stable, but otherwise pretty much the same. Down here, we have our electron. Now, it's part of a group called the leptons. And the electron has heavier, less stable cousins as well, called the muon and the tau. Each one of these leptons, these are the charged leptons in ordinary matter, they are negatively charged. They each have an associated neutrino, nu e, nu mu, nu tau. The Greek letter nu is used to represent neutrinos. And in addition to these particles, we have these four force carriers, which as the name suggests, they carry the fundamental forces of the universe. Photon carries the electromagnetic force, uh, but we're really interested in these two here, which carry the weak force or the weak interaction. 
So what does that mean? Well, there are four fundamental interactions that govern all of the universe, how everything behaves. And these are gravity, the weak nuclear force or interaction. Those two words are used interchangeably, electromagnetic and strong. Now, gravity, we're pretty much all familiar with. Electromagnetic force, that governs light, chemistry, most of everyday life. The weak and the strong interactions only really occur and are important in subatomic or nuclear interactions at very, very small scales. And the weak interaction, as the name suggests, is very weak. And so if any of these other, if any of the others are present, uh, the weak interaction gets washed out. Neutrinos are unique in that they only feel the weak interaction, which means two things. One, it gives us a deep insight into how that interaction works that only neutrinos can give. And because they only feel the weak interaction in gravity, they don't get deflected or stopped or absorbed very easily, which is why, like I said, they can travel straight from the other side of the universe to us, and we know exactly where they came from. They are very, very light. Uh, they have not for a long time they were thought well for a long time they were thought to have zero mass but we've learned that they're not quite zero but they're so light we haven't been able to weigh them there are huge experiments underway to try to find their mass but we don't know what it is and to give you some idea how light they are imagine going back to the time of these cave paintings 30 some thousand years ago and collecting four billion electrons in other words one electron for every two people on earth right now collect four billion of them every second of every day for almost 32,000 years. You put all that enormous number of electrons together, you would have about the mass of a grain of sand. And a neutrino is at least 600,000 times lighter than that. So things are very light. They're also very difficult to detect. And <clears throat> you can think of that a few different ways. One is that they're just very small, that when they try to go through, when they encounter matter like us or rock or stars, they go in between all of the atoms and subatomic particles like a mosquito flying through the woods. They have a very, very low probability of interacting with any other matter. So some of them can go through a light year of lead and not hit anything. The sun, as we'll learn, produces them in prodigious quantities. About 50 trillion of them are passing through every one of us right now, every second, even though it's nighttime because they go right through the earth, right through us and on their way, and we never notice. So they're very weakly interacting is the technical way to say it, but they're just, and that's why they're called the ghost particle because they just pass through everything else without touching it. So they're very ghostly. Now that has an advantage if one can study them because as I said, it gives us a direct line of sight from whatever made them to us. It also allows us to see inside of things where they're being produced that block, light, or any other messengers. The disadvantage is detecting them is extremely difficult. So for most of human history, we didn't even know they existed. And that raises the question, well, when did we figure it out? How, when did we find out that these things exist? And the story begins actually with a bit of a mystery. So specifically, it's about a particular kind of radioactive decay called beta decay, where a neutron splits into a proton and an electron. Free neutrons are unstable. Many uh, radioactive atoms do the same thing where one of their neutrons goes through this reaction and spits out an electron when a ne neutron becomes a proton. And neutron and neutrino have very similar names because they're both electrically neutral. They have no charge. So it was assumed that this particular interaction would obey conservation of energy. That was the way science was under way, the way physics was understood to work, that all of the energy that was in the neutron would still be present in the proton and the electron and their kinetic energy. And so thus we can scientifically make predictions. We can calculate exactly how much energy these things should have, which is the equivalent of calculating how fast they should be going after this reaction. And so measuring that is sort of like, if we measure a large number of them, sort of like having all these electrons in a race. And what was predicted in the 1920s and 30s was that they would all arrive at the finish line at the same time because they're all going the same speed. What was actually observed 
was they were all going different speeds and they were all going slower than expected, which means not only was there this distribution that could not be understood, but there was energy missing, which means meant either conservation of energy didn't apply at the subatomic scale, which would have been very disturbing, or something else even weirder was going on. And the first person to propose what the something weirder was is Wolfgang Pauli. He's a very famous particle physicist. You might've heard the Pauli exclusion principle. That's what he won the Nobel prize for in 1945. And he actually proposed what would be called the neutrino in a letter to a conference on radioactivity that began rather famously, dear radioactive ladies and gentlemen. And he was, in, he was writing in German because that was really the language of physics at the time. So he proposed this in 1930. And basically his proposal was this missing energy is being carried away by a third particle that we can't detect yet. And so given that they couldn't detect it and that they could have they had good measurements of uh, the proton and the electron, it really constrained the properties the neutrino could have. It had to be electrically neutral. It had to be very light, very weakly interacting and some other properties that the neutrino we know today has. Now, this was just a proposal, a prediction. It took 26 years to find them. So they were first detected in 1956, which means our knowledge of these particles' existence is younger than possibly some of the people listening to this talk right now. That there are, pe there are plenty of people walking around who were born before we knew these things existed. Now, as I said, neutrinos very rarely interact with ordinary matter. So the probability of an interaction as a neutrino is passing through any sort of detector one might set up is very low. So in order to <clears throat> in, in order to actually detect them, we need to increase the odds somehow. And one simple way to do that is just go to a place that has a huge number of neutrinos coming out. And one such place would be a nuclear reactor. And that's what these two scientists, Rhines and Cowan, did. They set up their detector by a nuclear reactor called Savannah River. And they detected this reaction, which was basically the reverse of beta decay. A neutrino would collide with a proton, change it into a neutron, and they would detect the electron, or actually the positron in this case, that came out. And they published their results in 1956, first the de detection and discovery of these particles. And the Nobel Committee didn't get around to awarding a prize for it until 1995. And only Rhines won it because by the time they did that, uh, Dr. Cowan had died, but they are still remembered together as Rhines and Cowan in the neutrino community. So how do we detect them? You have, especially how do we detect them uh, in the astronomical context where you can't really control how many of them you have coming at your detector. So really the way I think of it is they're detected kind of like the wind. We can't see them directly the way we can with light, but we can see their effects and specifically the effects of the, of the neutrino colliding with the nucleus, producing some other nucleus or other stuff, and a charged lepton. So this might be an electron, a muon, or a tau. And which one it is and what the charge is gives us information about the neutrino that caused this reaction. And so if we want to increase the odds of neutrinos interacting with matter, we either need a lot of neutrinos, which is what Ryan and Cowan did, or we need a lot of matter, and that's how neutrino telescopes work. We put a very, very large mass of material in the way of neutrinos, and everywhere's in the way of neutrinos, so that's not hard. We have a we put instrumentation on a large amount of matter. We eliminate as much background as possible because a lot of other things, a lot of cosmic rays, radioactive decays, people dropping wrenches onto catwalks, which actually happened once. Uh, those things can mimic neutrino events. So you have to get a very, very shielded environment. And that's often done by going deep underground. So you set up a large mass of matter with very sensitive instrumentation and shield it as much as you can and then wait. And wait for what's going on on the right to happen. So that's exactly what a scientist named Raymond Davis did in 1968 in a mine in South Dakota. This is actually very close to where I was a professor. And in 1968, 
he used 100,000 gallons of dry cleaning fluid. That was the large mass of matter, uh, 48,000 50 feet, or sorry, 4,850 feet underground to detect neutrinos coming from the sun. So this was the first time we detected neutrinos from beyond the earth. So this is really the birth of neutrino astronomy. And so his specific interaction was this here, the neutrino interacts with a chlorine nucleus, produces an atom of argon and an electron. And he had a very clever chemical method for for finding the argon atom, which was unstable and would decay. And so he was finding and counting the decays of individual argon atoms to do this experiment. It was an extraordinary effort. Uh, you can actually see him here. He's swimming not in dry cleaning fluid because I think that would be very bad for you, but there was a water pool basically around the detector, which is the white thing on the right here. The dry cleaning fluid is inside this big white tank. Uh, the water just forms another layer of shielding. And so he discovered neutrinos coming from the sun and won the Nobel Prize for that, again, very belatedly in 2002. Another important neutrino observatory is the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. This is in Sudbury, Canada. Uh, so it's, uh, the ac it's abbreviated as SNOW. Particle physicists really like their acronyms too. Uh, here we have an even larger scale experiment. We have a hundred, we have a thousand tons of heavy water where heavy water means the hydrogen atom has a proton and a neutron. This enables uh, one to detect all three flavors of neutrinos. The uh, home stake experiment Ray Davis's could only detect one flavor. Uh, it's even deeper underground, almost 7,000 feet. And you have basically this big sphere or beaker of water here with all sorts of instrumentation around it to detect the interaction of the neutrinos with the water. And uh, this won a Nobel Prize in 2015 for its discoveries about neutrinos. Now, the current leader in the, in, at least in the neutrino end of multi-messenger astronomy, is an experiment called Ice Cube. And when I say large amount of matter, I mean large amount of matter. This experiment is at the South Pole in Antarctica and has instrumented a cubic kilometer of the Antarctic ice. Uh, so it actually goes from 1,450 meters deep all the way down to the bedrock with several thousand of these digital, digital optical modules. So this first chunk of Antarctic ice, that's just the shielding and the actual detector is down here. Now, the way this detector works is by detecting Shrenkov light. So that occurs whenever a charged particle tra travels through transparent matter quickly enough uh, near the speed of light. And so when you have high energy neutrino interactions that produce one of these charged leptons, it can detect that lepton. And sometimes if that lepton decays, it's decay products. So it is a major contributor to multi-messenger astronomy just because it's sheer volume means it can actually detect a fair number of neutrinos coming from out in space. So now that we can detect these things, what's making them out there in the universe that uh, is sending them to us? So how are they produced? Well, of course, we've already talked about radioactive decay. Uh, many atomic nuclei decay this way, where there's a neutron that changes into a proton and then spits out an electron and a neutrino, or in this case, an antineutrino, which I'll get to what that means in a minute. Uh, many isotopes do this, including one of the more fun ones that tends to get noticed is potassium-40, which is, of course, a naturally occurring isotope of potassium that occurs in bananas. So bananas are radioactive and they're in also neutrino sources. Uh, but then again, so are you, so is everything around us. Everything has some level of radioactivity in it. So the universe is full of radioactive matter, which means it's full of neutrinos. So this is neutrino production when subatomic particles or atomic nuclei fall apart. We can also get them by smashing particles together. So antimatter is real and a very important object in physics. Every particle type, so electron, muon, proton, has an antiparticle. And when you collide a particle and antiparticle, they annihilate each other and something new appears in their place. And that new thing can be a neutrino. It doesn't have to be matter-antimatter either. You collide any two particles at high enough energy, you're going to find something new. 
antiparticles are denoted by either a bar over the particle or the opposite charge sign. So this is an electron, this is a positron, this is an electron neutrino, this is an anti-electron neutrino. That's why some of these uh, diagrams have bars over them because you're dealing with antineutrinos. So particle collisions produce new particles, including neutrinos. Uh, there are many artificial sources, nuclear reactors, as we've talked about. Uh, those are still used in neutrino experiments very actively today. This is an experiment in South Korea on the right, where you've got six nuclear reactors and two neutrino detectors. Nuclear bombs, of course, produce them. Particle accelerators, both medical and scientific. Basically, anywhere we're either smashing nuclei together or splitting them apart. Uh, though we're not really concerned with artificial sources here. We want to do astronomy, which means we want to know about natural sources. So the nearest natural source of astronomical neutrinos that we've actually been able to detect is the sun. And over here on the left, you have the fusion chain that powers the sun, starting out with two protons, just two hydrogen nuclei, and smash them together until you get helium. And neutrinos are actually produced at several stages along this process. Uh, you can see two of them here, but there are more if you look into it. And of course, every star does this that's fusing, produces neutrinos, but the sun is close enough, produces a large enough flux, we can actually detect them. Uh, we have detected them at several energies uh, from the different stages of nuclear fusion, and this has been is now been studied fairly carefully. So the interesting thing is that fusion only occurs in the sun's core, which means we can see into the core of the sun using neutrinos because the neutrinos travel right through all the other matter in the sun to us without interruption. And thus we can basically X-ray the core of the sun with these neutrinos in a way we couldn't with any other messenger. And that's true in a lot of other cases where we can see deep into the heart of astrophysical processes that otherwise would be just completely opaque, literally. Uh, one of the more famous sources of neutrinos are supernovae. And they are quite prodigious sources as tremendously energetic as supernovae are in visible light and electromagnetic radiation, 99% of a supernova's energy is radiated away as neutrinos. In other words, however spectacularly bright Betelgeuse is going to be when it finally blows up, a hundred times that much energy will be hitting us in neutrinos. Only once have we actually managed to detect neutrinos from a supernova so far. And that's when 25 were detected from supernova 1987A, which you might've heard of. It was in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. We haven't seen any nearby supernova since then, but we're definitely looking for them. Uh, we also expect there to be a diffuse background of neutrinos from all the supernovae that have occurred throughout cosmic history because supernovae happen all the time, uh, the neutrinos are still out there from them, and so we hope someday to find that diffuse background. And the scientific community is so eager to find neutrinos from a supernova that there's actually a consortium of experiments called the Supernova Early Warning System. It's several different neutrino experiments all around the world, including Ice Cube that we mentioned, that are always alert in case they see a sudden spike in neutrino activity that might indicate a supernova. So supernova interiors are so incredibly dense and hot because you've got several times the mass of the sun crashing down into a small space that light actually can't get out initially. It's completely opaque, but the neutrinos can, which means the neutrinos are actually the first things to get out of a supernova, and thus they might arrive hours or days or even weeks before the light does. So one of the so this snooze system might indicate a supernova is occurring and give astronomers time to point their telescopes at the right part of the sky to see it when it first starts in visible light, which would be really important. And that's where we amateur astronomers can come in because when one of these snooze alerts is issued, uh, it doesn't have great directionality. We don't really know exactly where in the sky to look. So if a bunch of amateur and professional astronomers all point their telescopes at roughly the same area, and somebody gets lucky enough to actually see the first pinpoint of light of the new supernova, that would be an unprecedented event of actually being able to study one from the very earliest stages and to see it in both light and neutrinos. The light tells us about the outer parts. The neutrinos tell us about the actual interior collapse and explosion. So if you want to get in on that, uh, here's the website, or just search for snooze neutrino or snooze supernova, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. Another 
source where we have detected neutrinos is something called a blazar. Now, this is an active galactic nucleus, black hole surrounded by an accretion disk that's shooting jets of energy and particles out into space. And it's a blazar if one happens to be pointed straight at us. One In 2017, Ice Cube uh, detected a neutrino. And this is how early we are in the whole neutrino astronomy game. Detecting single neutrinos can actually be significant. Uh, this particular blazar uh, was flaring, got very bright for a little while, and Ice Cube detected a neutrino at the same time. And effectively what's going on here is this cosmic, uh, this active galactic nucleus is acting like a cosmic particle accelerator. It's slamming atoms into each other at very high energies, producing neutrinos and a bunch of other things, including gamma rays and visible light, so it can be studied in many different ways. And this was the first detection of neutrinos from outside the solar system since 1987. Now, I forgot to look up just how far away this was, but it's significantly further away than this active galactic nucleus in NGC 1068, uh, because this one is not nearly as violent or bright, but it uh, is close enough that Ice Cube was able to detect 80 neutrinos, which is a whole lot in neutrino physics, uh, from this galaxy, which of course is, as the paper they published it in said, not enough to answer all our questions, but a big step towards actually realizing neutrino astronomy. So we can see into the interior of this active galactic nucleus with neutrinos 47 million light years away. There's also something which I didn't know about until I started researching for this talk, something called a tidal disruption event, which is when a star gets too close to a black hole and is ripped apart by it. And this is another extremely violent event that can produce lots of light, lots of radiation, and neutrinos. An ice cube has detected an individual neutrino from two such events. So two neutrinos uh, from two events, but that's more than we had before. So you might be noticing a theme that all of these things that we've actually detected neutrinos from, are ex except for the sun, are extremely high energy violent events. And that's not a coincidence because a neutrino is easier to detect when it's higher energy. The more energetic it is, the more likely it is that it interacts with matter and thus we can see it. So the lower energy ones get progressively more challenging to see as they get lower in energy, both because they're just less likely to interact and because there's more and more background events that can obscure them and we can mistake, we have to get rid of in order to find. Now, one other violent event that we expect to produce neutrinos that we haven't actually seen them yet are neutron star mergers. Now, this uh, was pretty famous when it happened, GW170817 was the first event observed with both gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation. So it was two neutron stars colliding and exploding, and it was detected in gamma rays and visible light and by gravitational waves. So this was another important milestone in multi-messenger astronomy, the first event to be detected by two different messengers. And this event must have produced neutrinos, but we weren't able to detect them but we will keep looking. And when we see one with gravitational waves, light and neutrinos, that will be a major milestone in multi-messenger astronomy and really help us to understand what the interior of these incredibly violent events are like. Now, there are even, as I said, more challenging neutrino sources that are lower in energy and it's harder to detect. So neutrinos were produced in the Big Bang. And there are a couple of really important ways in which this ties into astronomy. One is that matter and antimatter, we think were produced in equal parts in the Big Bang. And thus they should have annihilated each other and there should be nothing left but neutrinos and radiation. Our existence and the existence of the universe indicates that matter had a very small, about one part in 10 billion advantage over antimatter. We don't know why this was, but neutrinos could hold the answer. And that's one of the things that neutrinos are studied for in laboratories. In terms of studying neutrinos from the sky, the, our current models, current understanding of cosmology says that a neutrino background exists, a cosmic neutrino background analogous to the cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background came from the time of the universe's history about 370,000 years after the beginning, when it cooled down enough that it was no longer glowing white hot like a lava lamp, it actually 
became transparent to photons, and some of those have been traveling ever since, and we can detect them to create beautiful maps like this. There is an equivalent, we think, cosmic neutrino background. And since neutrinos are so much more weakly interacting, the universe became transparent to them much earlier, only about a second after the beginning. Now, these are going to be very low energy and extremely hard to detect. But if we can detect them, we can build a portrait of the universe not hundreds of thousands of years after the beginning, but only a second after the beginning. And that would be a major step forward in understanding literally everything. All right, so that's all the sources we found and that we think might be, and some more that we think might be out there. But where are they? You know, when we look up in the sky, we can see where the stars are. Where are these neutrinos coming from? Well, in some sense, they're everywhere. They're flooding throughout the universe because they're produced by stars, radiation, all these different violent events I've talked about. But as one of the, one paper from IceCube put it, the origins of the high energy cosmic neutrino flux remain largely unknown. We know these neutrinos are out there. But we don't actually know for sure where most of them come from. And that's just the higher energy neutrinos, the lower energy ones beyond the sun, we haven't been able to detect them at all yet. So where in the sky have we actually seen them? This is really the first attempt at a map of the neutrino sky. Uh, this is drawn from a sample of about 60,000 neutrinos from Ice Cube. And this is sort of a probability map of where there are most likely to be neutrino sources based on where the neutrinos have been seen. So the darker areas indicate a higher likelihood. And you can see this gray band here is the galactic plane, and this dot is the galactic center. So it seems like the neutrino sources, not particularly surprisingly, uh, cluster around the galactic plane. Now, we don't know what they are or really exactly where they are because this is very early in the neutrino astronomy era, but this neutrino sky is just barely starting to come into focus. And so it's a very exciting time to see it happen. Uh, where do we go from here? Well, we will continue detecting neutrinos from these very violent events and with bigger, more sensitive detectors, hopefully detect more of them. Uh, we're looking for background neutrinos from the cumulative supernova throughout the history of the universe, and of course, waiting for uh, galactic supernova. I mean, if Betelgeuse has exploded and all of that information is on, is on its way to us, it's going to light up every neutrino detector on Earth pretty spectacularly because it's relatively close. Are uh, there more ambitious projects to see the cosmic neutrino background and uh, other low energy neutrino events that are very challenging? Uh, another really big milestone will be finding light neutrinos and gravitational waves from the same event. So that's about it. Uh, we're just waiting and listening for the next big milestones in the neutrino era. More discoveries and surprises are certainly in store. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Korn. And if you do have questions, hit the Q&A button. We got a few coming in already, but uh, I'm going to ask one of my own here first. So, you know, we have these neutrinos coming in from the sun all the time, right? So how do you point at this one neutrino and said, oh, this came from a blazar or these 25 over here came from a supernova? How do you tell where they're coming from and what their source is? Well, there's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, one is energy. Like the neutrinos from the blazar or the supernova are significantly higher in energy than the neutrinos from the sun. So that's one way to distinguish them. And indeed, that was the only way for the blazar that Ice Cube knew that's where it probably was coming from because it was so high energy. And uh, in terms of directionality in the sky, well, we know where the sun is, so that's pretty easy. But uh, in terms of other direction, other events, um, we don't have a great sense of directionality, but when these neutrinos enter ice cube or other detectors, some of them are segmented enough that you can see what direction the resulting fragments of atoms go. And so you can use that to reconstruct roughly, basically using conservation of momentum, reconstruct roughly where in the sky it came from. And you say, okay, and that like when um, that gravitational wave event was discovered, it was similar. The gravitational wave observers don't have a really tight pointing on the sky. So a whole bunch of astronomers just started looking uh, in the general area and they started looking at individual galaxies and somebody just got lucky enough to find it. Cool. 
All right. Awesome. Yeah. I had a bunch of questions as I was uh, watching your presentation, but he kept answering them for me ahead of time. So I guess that uh, speaks That's to good. how well thought out that was. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Got a couple in, coming in here from a uh, member. So Isabel asks, how do you decipher neutrinos emitted from our galactic core, for example, and the ones that are coming from the original inflation soup of hydrogen and helium? Similar question to mine. So like the original inflation soup, I think that that's talking about the cosmic neutrino background or something yeah. similar. Those, uh, I, I guess I didn't really want to get into the technical details of energies, but the neutrinos from the origin of the universe are going to be thousands of times at least less energetic than the neutrinos from the sun. So we just don't have the technology yet to detect those. So uh, we also know we have very good models of what's going on inside the sun and thus what energy ranges those neutrinos should occupy. We also, because the sun produces so many of them, can collect a lot of them and thus get a tighter uh, idea of where exactly they're coming from. Cool. And uh, just for my own curiosity, like if Betelgeuse were to send off some neutrinos, how would that compare to what we see on a regular basis from our own sun? Like, is that more than we would see from the sun or is it much, much less? Again, it would be in a different energy range. So yeah. uh, like Ice Cube and some of these other, they can't see solar neutrinos because they're too low energy. Uh, but if Betelgeuse were to explode, it would send out so many high energy neutrinos that there are some people who are legitimately worried it would break the software and would overload some of these detectors because there would be so many of them in this higher energy regime. I don't know if that's still a worry, but at one point it was. So yeah, right, a lot so of these energies, a lot of this, a lot of the answers are neutrinos from different sources have very different energies. And that's one of the primary ways we can tell them apart. Got it. Makes sense. John Pinto asks, can you explain the significance about the way neutrinos change their type between the three types? I could, but that <laughs> would require an entire other talk. I mean, in my original draft of this talk, I actually had put that in, but I realized that was trying to cram too much into one. And that, that so far hasn't really been relevant to astronomy yet. So to explain for everyone else what uh, he's talking about, uh, let me go back here. So like I said, neutrinos have three different flavors, the electron, the muon, and the tau. And what's really weird about neutrinos is that you can produce one kind in one place and they will actually change flavor. They will change from one to the other as they travel. And the physics behind that is really interesting and somewhat complicated. And it was a big discovery when it happened. It's one of the really interesting uh, areas of neutrino research right now, but uh, it isn't really relevant to neutrino, neutrino astronomy just yet. Cool. Thank you. One last for me. So uh, as an amateur astronomer, how do I sign up for alerts from Snooze? How do I know when uh, there's something to look at up there? Oh, well, you go to, let me just leave it up here so people have time to write it down if they need or if they can watch the recording. Just go to this website and it'll direct you where you need to go. All right. We're, uh, we, we lost your screen sharing there. So uh, maybe you can throw oh. it in the chat. Or... Oh, yeah, sure. I could. Oops. Yes, I can do that. One moment. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for your flexibility uh, in presenting this talk. Uh, we had you slated for last month, but we had some last second schedule drama, as you recall. So thanks for uh, thanks for your flexibility in presenting tonight. Great talk. And uh, yeah, if you have any more questions for Dr. Corwin, um, you're hanging out on Groups IO. Oh, one more came in. Hang on. From Bethan okay. Feinstein. How do neutrinos act in a hot plasma or a strong magnetic field? So, okay, I just put the snooze alert link in the chat. So in a strong magnetic field, they don't care. Uh, like I said, they're electrically neutral. And so far as we know, they don't have any magnetic moment, although people are trying to measure one. Uh, but yeah, they, they, as far as we know, they're simply not affected by magnetic fields at all. And in terms of a hot plasma, in most cases, they're going to go right through it without even knowing it's there. It's only when you get to extremely dense situations like the interior of a collapsing supernova that there's even enough uh, matter for neutrinos to seriously interact with anything at all. So like hot plasmas, in even in the sun, once they're produced, they just shoot straight out and almost never interact. Very cool. 
All right. Well, thank you for uh, telling us about the ghost particles in the sky. That was a great talk. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Cool. All right. Well, uh, hope to see you at the next meeting. Good meeting you. And let me mark this question as answered. And with that, let's go on to our astrophotography showcase and let's see if I can figure out how Zoom works. So let's see. Uh, share screen. I want that one. Share. And that's not the right slide. There we go. Astrophotography showcase. So as always, if you are here and uh, your images are coming up, I will hand over the virtual microphone and allow you to talk about it in your own words. If you're not here, um, well, if I have notes from you, then I'll just talk about it myself. So uh, who's up first? Let's see. Andy Sova. Let's see. Are you here? I don't think you are. All right. So uh, basically this is... Uh, Come on, PowerPoint, you can do it. Looks like the Veil Nebula, very cool work there. Some narrow band work there. He uh, says he used both hydrogen alpha and oxygen three, seven nanometer narrow band filters with 4X HOO pixel math. Great image there, Andy Sova. Thank you for sharing that one. And you can see the uh, witch's broom, we call that up the at the top there with a little eyeball on it. That's what I see there anyway, but very timely for uh, Halloween time, the witch's broom nebula. There's also another part of uh, the larger veil nebula that kind of looks like a bat. So it's a very appropriate target for uh, for the fall, I think. Bob Santanella, I know you're here. Let me hand over the mic here. And go ahead and unmute if you have a microphone. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Where okay. Yep. Uh, well, this was a shot I took uh, from Veterans Park for one of the SpaceX launches that was um, happening. They've been doing them so frequently. Um, my wife loves to uh, go over and enjoy them. And uh, I used uh, my Canon 5D Mark IV with uh, Rokinon uh, 24 millimeter F1.4 lens. Uh, this was shot at F22. And uh, the exposure is three minutes and 50 seconds. And it is untracked. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, there's another launch uh, tomorrow night, I think, around 8.30. It's going to be a uh, return to landing zone one, I believe. So if anyone's in the uh, Space Coast area, come on out and photograph that one, too. should be a fun one with the boosters coming back to land as well. But a uh, beautiful shot there, Bob. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yep. Wow. Okay. Let's see if I can get PowerPoint to behave. John Pinto, I know you're around. John Pinto got a new toy. Yes, <clears throat> I've been waiting for this uh, for uh, quite a number of months. Uh, as soon as I heard about it, I was actually hesitant to invest in it right away. But then I started seeing uh, people testing it out, beta testing it. And uh, it looked like it's, to me, one of the uh, perfect outreach tools, which is something I've been looking for for a long time. So when we, you know, go to a STEM night or a STEAM night at a school and kids want to, you know, see what you're looking at and they want to take something home, this sounded like a great idea where we could, you know, sh easily uh, share uh, photos to their phones that they could take home and show their friends uh, and get excited about astronomy. Unfortunately, I just got it just the other day, so I really don't know everything about it yet. But they don't really have what I'll call a uh, sharing mode just yet. But um, there's rumors that it's in the works. So my ultimate uh, way to do this would be if the C Star set up what I'll call a guest website, in because uh, it does come with the Wi-Fi built in. Have the kids join the uh, the Wi-Fi and be able to browse to. Um, this I'm um, just call it a guest website that would host the photos that we're we're imaging, uh, and then they could download it to their phone. So you know that to me that's the ultimate dream because uh, whenever I'm doing outreach, and I know a lot of our other outreach folks know this, the first thing people want to do is take a picture of what you're looking at through their phone, through their through their iPhone or their Android from the telescope lens, telescope eyepiece. Uh, this this just takes it to the next level. Because the as Frank's going to show you, 
the images you get out of this pretty much without working uh, are amazing for such a small little scope uh, and at such a to me a um, an amazing price point. Mm -hmm. uh, these types of of um, of systems used to cost three, four, five, six thousand dollars. You know, and in a completely integrated live stacking system. This, this when I bought it, uh, they were running a special because it was like a pre order. It was four hundred dollars. Uh, oh, you can order them now for five hundred dollars. So it's yeah. it's amazing. So Frank, if you want to just a couple of the, the shots. Yeah, I didn't know they were that cheap. Actually, that's that's amazing. That's cool. Yeah, yeah this is like your first light, wasn't it? Yep. This was the actual. Well, it's actually this is the second one. Okay. Uh, in the sense of, I took a picture of the moon first, uh, but then the second thing it was the sun. So this comes with a solar filter, um, and the uh, C star actually has four modes for um, imaging modes. It has a uh, what do you call a scenery mode? You know, you could just take pictures of birds in your backyard, uh, and it is a pretty amazing uh, how good the the zoom and the detail is on it. Uh, I I took a picture of a house that's like a quarter of a mile away and I could see the shutters in their windows. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, but anyway, so you have a scenery mode, you have a solar mode. Um, and one of the things they recently added was a time-lapse mode for the sun. And I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure they did that for the upcoming total eclipse in April. People definitely want to take a time-lapse photo of the moon going across the sun. So that's going to be uh, pretty amazing. They have a lunar mode. I don't know, Frank, if you got the lunar one uh lined up but it's got a great lunar mode yeah. yep there you that was actually the first that was actually the very first picture um <clears throat> and then it obviously obviously has a deep sky mode if you want to show yep so obviously andromeda that's only 10 minutes and mm. i did nothing to it that's just point tell it go to a uh, andromeda start taking uh images auto stacks uh 10 10 second subs for as long as you want and I'm sure if I had let it go for an hour, it would be even more amazing. But imagine going to a STEM night and being able to have kids take that home with them from what they were just seeing. I just think that's that's mind-blowing. Yeah. Um, Bubble Nebula. Now, again, this is crazy. This is, I think, Frank, if we look at the bottom, I think this is four minutes. That's <laughs> just four minutes of exposure. That, that's that's crazy. And M52 in the, in the bottom right corner. Uh, and again, I did no processing on this. I, I'm not ready to jump in that rabbit hole. This is just straight out of whatever the sea star can do. Now, I know it has some, this dual narrowband filter included, right? So is this using yeah, that, that or is it just straight up RGB? Uh, this, this I did turn the, uh, the dual band on because they did recommend it for any emission nebula. And obviously the bubbles, bubble is an emission nebula. So I turned it on. Again, it was this experiment. It was the only thing I used it on uh, last night. Um, and they basically promote it as a light pollution filter. Um, yeah, so yeah. you really don't want to use it for galaxies or, or star clusters or anything like that. Um, it also comes with a, a dark uh, filter because before you image for the night, the first image that you, the first object you want to image, the first thing it does is it goes away for about two minutes and takes darks. And then it uses that mask for any future uh, imaging you do that particular night. Um, I'm not going to get into why you do that, but it's you know it's part of standard astrophotography processing. And then the last thing is that it has, and I'm not really quite sure when it uses this or why it uses this. Frank, you might be able, able to explain this better. It has something called a UVIR cut filter. Yeah. Um, don't know why, why it's used or when it's used, but that's in there as well. So uh, this is uh, the uh, double cluster in, in Perseus. Uh, again, I think this was like three minutes. I mean... It's crazy. Yeah, that's really great stuff. I, I had no idea. Like, that's a huge value, like including all those filters and uh, everything that it does. I mean, Unistellar has to be uh, sweating bullets right now, I would think. <laughs> well, I have a feeling ZWO definitely wanted to um, gain market share. Yeah. And uh, it's definitely going to force these other companies to, to either come down in price or just go to business. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, great stuff. Um, uh, thanks for uh, being the guinea pig with this system, but the uh, the early results look good, and the software is just going to get better, I imagine. So this is a, yeah, a so, game changer, uh, as they say. Yeah. So uh, one of the folks on the uh, astron on our astronomy site posted a picture of 
all of the uh, Messier objects and how difficult they are to uh, image. So, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test out the sea star going down that <laughs> that list <laughs> to see where <Absolutely>. it breaks. <laughs> Excellent. Good stress test. Awesome. Thank you, John. That's great. Like, wow. I, I might have to get one of those things just for fun. Yeah. Like, it's just, uh, and it, you can just like plop it down, right? Is it just like the unit stellar where, where you just like stick it down and it figures out how it'll align itself and where it is? And it's, yeah. I mean, easy. you may have to make, you know, make sure it's level. Uh, it may ask you to calibrate the compass inside of it so it knows kind yeah. of where north is and stuff like that. But basically, that took, I don't know, three minutes and I just started imaging. It was, it was, wow. it was crazy. The one nice. thing it does not have, and obviously it, this isn't a complete uh, imaging system. It doesn't. You can't put a schedule in, right? You can't say, okay, I want to do this object at this time for this much time. So you can you can't just like leave it for the night to do all of your your uh, workflow. You actually have to sit there and you know just sit there and wait for it to to do what you want to do, and then point it to the next object. Yeah. Yeah. But man, for outreach, that's awesome. I mean, uh, you know, it takes me at least a half an hour to set up my rig and three minutes sounds pretty appealing to me. So that's uh, yeah. really cool. Love to think about getting one of these for the club, I think. Cool. Well, thank you, John. Uh, sure. Had a couple of comments come in from Robert Vogel while you were talking. Uh, not a question for you, but just sort of an observation. There's definitely a good astrophotography opportunity tomorrow morning with the Moon-Venus conjunction. Uh, he says that there's going to be a Hubble Space Telescope pass at the same time going west to east through the conjunction at 5.15 a.m. So if you're up, try to catch that. That's a pretty cool scene. Even if you don't capture it with a camera, capturing that with your eyeballs would be pretty neat too. So I think I might have to get up early. And uh, he says to use the moon after sunrise to find Venus in daylight. So yes, that's right. If you can spot the moon, then Venus will be there too during the day. It's always fun to spot planets uh, when you're not supposed to be able to see them. So <laughs> thank you, Robert, for sharing that. And I got a few of my own here. Uh, so we had some glorious clear nights this past month. A few uh, goodies here from Scopey McScope Face in my backyard. Uh, this one is from last night's clear night, uh, NGC 1333, which is a reflection nebula in uh, Perseus. And this one is super cool. I mean, not only is it a reflection nebula, that's that whole like bluish area that they're being lit up by that star in the middle there. But those red blobby things above it are even more cool. Those are Herbig Harrow objects. Those are jets of gas being spewed out by newly forming stars. How cool is that? It blows my mind. We can actually see this from uh, from a backyard under like Bortle 5 slash 6 skies. So uh, this is all, all over a single night last night. Uh, just straight up RGB as well. There's no narrow band going on here whatsoever. So pretty happy with how that came up. Uh, I think uh, one thing I learned is I went from 60 second exposures to 120 second exposures for each uh, red, green, and blue filter. And um, I think that caused me to bring out a little bit more depth in the image than I've been getting before. So sometimes longer is better, even with these fancy new CMOS cameras. Earlier, um, I imaged NGC 210, a smaller galaxy, but one that doesn't get a whole lot of love in the astro imaging community. So I gave it some love. Uh, you probably can't see it too much on Zoom here, but there's a whole bunch of other galaxies in the background, and I think that's what's really cool about this image. It's just uh, one of those deep field things that just remind you how many galaxies are out there, and every one of those galaxies has hundreds of billions of stars and maybe hundreds of billions of worlds as well. So it uh, just uh, gives you some perspective. A lot of those blobs you see in the background are not stars, but other galaxies that are even further away, which I think is cool. This next one is called the Hidden Galaxy. Um, I see something for I forget what it is now. Uh, you don't see this one image too often, even though it is relatively bright. That's because it's located at the outer fringes of the Milky Way in the sky. So there's a lot of gas and dust and stars between us and it. Uh, but it's still a fairly bright galaxy, so it's really not that hard to capture. Um, I augmented this with some hydrogen alpha exposure time as well. So those red blobs you see are actually nebulas in another galaxy, which is even more cool. So a very um, underappreciated galaxy, I think. Uh, this is imaged over a couple of nights, and you can even see some of the uh, tidal streams around it, those sort of uh, glowing areas of starlight at the outer fringes of it. And if you look closely, you can even see some areas of hydrogen uh, that are pretty far from the galaxy itself. So this thing is actually quite a bit bigger than it looks at first glance. Uh, you might have seen the uh, images that came out of the Euclid Space Telescope today as well. This is one of the targets that they released. Um, Euclid, of course, can zoom in much more than this, but um, the image they released is kind of comparable to this one. So I... Looking forward to seeing that uh, really do what it can do and zoom in more to individual stars within these things. 
and using its near infrared capabilities, it can punch through that gas and dust of the, the Milky Way a little bit better than I can too. Obviously, we had the partial solar eclipse this past month as well. This was uh, done just after that live stream that we did with the uh, Seminole State Planetarium. Um, Lunt 40 millimeter solar scope here. Um, just, you know, lucky imaging over 100 frames. And I still love that you can see prominences as well as detail on the sun's surface with that telescope. And of course, the moon itself starting to uh, occlude the sun. So I'm happy with that shot too. West Clem. Let's see. Are you here? I think you are. Let me give you the mic. Yes, sir. How are you doing? Are. Good, good. How are you? I'm awesome. So, yeah, we have the cosmic question mark here. NPC <laughs> uh, 7822. Um, I wanted to share this one because this is an image that I took when we were in uh, Geneva last month. So this is only about two and a half hours total uh, across uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. So... Uh, it's mainly hydrogen because with that amount of time, the O3 and S2 don't really do a whole lot. But I wanted to share because, you know, this was everything I got that night when we were out there. And uh, shout out to Chris and Bill and a few others for letting me uh, look through their scopes while my thing was just doing its thing. Yep, yep, I've been there. Um, also, just a little bit of context for this image, the little rosette, the dot of the question mark, if you will, um, that thing is about two-thirds the size of the moon right there. So this is a, through a 135 millimeter tiny little scope. It's my little travel scope. So this is a huge field of view. This is very big. So the moon is just a little little small chunk down there as far as uh, for comparing the size. Wow. That's why I never imaged it. It's just uh, too darn big for my field of view. So that's really cool. You get a lot more bang for your buck at the dark sites, though. You know, you can definitely get more in those two hours than you would in probably twice the amount. Certainly. I was surprised that the HA came out as much as it did for only 50 minutes. Absolutely. And we got some uh, Wizard Nebula action going on. Absolutely. So when I first started down this rabbit hole, um, there were a few objects that I would see images of that really just, they they sparked, they, they ignited my like excitement about this hobby. And whenever I would see a wizard, that, that was one of them that it was just like, that object I just thought was one of the most beautiful objects in the sky. Every time I saw it, it, it made me pause and look at it for a while. And so I finally have one of my own now, and I'm really, really happy with the way it turned out. I, I got a lot of O3 and a lot of uh, sulfur on it, so the, the blue and the gold really just pop, and I'm I'm really, really happy with this one. Yeah, gorgeous image. You know, getting that O3 just brings a whole dimension to it. Quite literally, it looks three-dimensional with that extra information, and Kind of looks like he's cooking up some sort of, uh, you know, cauldron there or something. I don't know. But he's up to something. Yeah, absolutely. No good for sure. Uh, the heart of the heart. Heart of the heart. My lot 15 and it's surrounding uh, little tendrils of nebulosity getting batted around by the the uh, solar winds from those clus that cluster. So it's a, it's just a beautiful area. I, I really, this one turned out much better than I thought it would. This is a... Also, a lower integration time than I usually do. This is on, only, quote unquote, 13 hours. Um, <laughs> and it, it just turned out so much better than I thought it would. I I, I was really excited. Um, even my wife, who like, she has a, a, you know, she helps me with some of these images, helps me with the colors, especially sometimes. Um, but when this one started finishing up and I was like putting the final touches on it, she like looked over and just said, wow, that was it's just a really cool area, and it always, it always uh, makes for a good image. I was really happy that mine turned out uh, pretty good. Yeah, that's awesome. I always see a crab when I see that thing. I don't know, but um, everyone sees what they will see. <laughs> that's uh, awesome work. You know, uh, kind of a, an aside here. Like, do you find that noise exterminator is just too darn good for its own good? Like, I find myself going with shorter integration times now, just because I know I can remove a lot of that noise uh, without going deeper. So. Uh, it's easy to abuse in yeah. the beginning, I would say. Like, you know, if you use, if you hit it with like 80, 90%, something like that, that it's, uh, yeah, it's tricky to to get right. And um, yeah, you can, you can abuse it. But if you use it just a little bit of a time over the course of the processing, I find that that helps a little bit. Instead of using 80, I, I sometimes use 40 or 60% and do that maybe two or three times over the course of it. That 
attenuates the the noise it gives it like that nice uh textury grainy feel without right. um over smoothing bits of it absolutely yeah it's definitely uh the default setting is like 90 percent, which is way too much so yeah that's uh, just hitting I mean, it with a sledgehammer but absolutely. that's no good in the end <laughs> cool. uh isabel has a couple of questions for you uh which one was the last one with the o3 and the sulfur i think we're talking about the uh the wizard nebula on that one right so yeah that's called the wizard nebula i forget its official name uh ngc something but <laughs> 7380 i think there you go yeah and, uh, i think officially one... that's the cluster but you know right yeah and malot 15 is officially the star cluster as well that we're looking at right now but this is the middle of the heart nebula which is a much larger object as well so Hope that answers your question, Isabel. Cool. All right. Thank you, Wes. Great stuff as always. And uh, John Starr, also a regular contributor of Awesome Things. Let me give you the mic. Hey. There you are. Yeah. So, um, so this, there's a couple shots here. This, um, this one is uh, a shot of the, um, the solar eclipse from last month. I uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to go out to Albuquerque. Um, was really, really fortunate that uh, it was overcast all night long, but during the day it was pretty clear here. So I, I shot this uh, over the course of about three hours or so. Um, this shot is every five minutes and it's, it's a very lightly processed. I took the, the background shot there of the Sandia Mountains right before, you can see it's kind of bright on the, on the left side of the image there, right before um the uh the sun was in frame and then i put the solar filter on and and set the intervalometer and and it did its thing for three hours and so um then all i did was was stack uh stack the images in in photoshop and and that was really it um so uh, i kind of i kind of like how it, how it came out um it was it was sort of fun, a fun shot to take it was certainly um it was certainly not um not very technical <laughs> um it, it kind of did its own thing so i i like how it, i like how it came out and this is really for me this was practice for the uh the eclipse uh in april i'm gonna i'm gonna attempt um a similar shot um with the solar filter and then i'll take it off during totality and and take a shot and then and then pop it back on i've, I've seen other other photographers do that with some success so i want to try to try to get that shot very cool. Yeah. You only have one shot at it, as they say. So you definitely want some practice. Yeah. I love this. It's just like this little circle in the middle. That's uh well-framed. You, uh, you had to have like, how do you figure out where to point your camera so that that's actually in the center or was this actually? Yeah. Like yeah. So this is, um, so I didn't, you know what? I didn't give any specifics. I apologize. So this was taken with a Canon EOS R, um, and it was taken with a Canon 16 to 24, uh, lens at 20 millimeters um, and really didn't crop it or anything. So the way I figured that out is there's an app called PhotoPills and it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, and essentially you, it has like a, um, I, I don't know what you could, AR, uh, augmented reality mode or something where you can kind of see what your background and then you can also see where the, the path of the eclipse is going to be. And you can put in there your your camera and you can put in your focal length and all these other settings um, and it will let you kind of um, visualize uh, where it's going to be. So I use that. I use it whenever I'm, I'm trying to take shots of like the moon over, you know, uh, a lighthouse or a water tower or anything like that. I use it to help help me compose the shots. Um, I also used it when I did that shot last month um, for um, the meteor shower um, to help compose that. So it's a it's a fantastic app. It's only a couple bucks or something, and and um, it's I use it more than probably any other um, astrophotography app. Um, that and Stellarium are the are my go tos. Very cool. Oh, uh, Isabel, I think was actually asking about Wesley's first image there. So sorry about that, Isabel. Uh, that first one was NGC 7822 and Sharpless 170. So I think that's the one you were asking about there. All right, John, uh, I've got your video queued up next. Hopefully PowerPoint will do the right thing with it. So wait for it, people. Let's see what happens. Play. Ooh. Bye bye, son. Very cool. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> this is 201 um 201 shots and uh and this was this was really tough actually to process it was pretty easy to take i got up um before the sun rose and i i solar polar aligned my star adventure 
And I used a Canon EOS RA and a Sigma um, 150 to 600 um, at 600 and um, with a solar filter. And I took um, a, a same shot, same idea as the other shot, um, a one shot every minute. But I must not have uh, got it just right, even though I was using sort of the, the solar tracking um, because it would drift. Um, it would drift. So every every at least you know every 45 minutes to an hour or so i'd have to um i'd have to get it back in the center of the frame and so i ended up having 201 shots um without the sun being perfectly centered and so i had to figure out how to um how to align that <laughs> it took me a long time to figure out how to do it um but i i did ultimately figure out how to do it it turns out that pics and sight can do that um it has a, a fantastic function in there that that helped do that and so i stacked it and then um after i stacked it i i exported those into a series of jpegs and then i just used the video edit feature in in photoshop to uh to put the video together awesome. and i'll got another copy of the same one here but Great work, John, and I uh, can't wait to see what you do with the uh, total solar eclipse next year. Very cool. Right, thank you. Thank you. And I think that's it. Let me double check my slides. Yep. Cool. So let me stop sharing. And yeah, so we're out of here uh, at a good time. So go on outside and enjoy the clear night tonight. Again, Jupiter is glorious tonight, as is Saturn. And if you're up early, don't miss the conjunction of venus and the moon with a little flyby by the hubble space telescope at uh what was it 5 15 yes 5 15 so i'll see you guys at the next uh at the holiday party will be your next meeting so don't forget december 16th mark your calendar six o'clock the festivities start uh some rsvp links will be going out soon so watch your emails for that we are going to require a free ticket for that it doesn't cost you anything as a member and uh, members and guests are welcome to come but we do ask that you reserve a uh, virtual free ticket just so we know how much food to buy so watch out for that coming out soon and also thanks to isabel for organizing that as well all right i'll see you guys at the holiday party maybe sooner and uh, hopefully we'll get some um hopefully we'll get some uh dark sky action at geneva this weekend or next as well all right thanks everyone keep looking up see you next time <laughs>